Okay. So we can uh, maybe start. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I'm Florence Durieux, the uh, curator of Parcours. And uh, sitting next to me is Tom Burr and uh, Valérie Snobuck, two of the artists who participated in, uh, in Parcours this year, which was inaugurated yes uh, yesterday. Um, I hope some of you, if not all of you, <laughs> saw the parkour already. Just a quick word um, about parkour. Uh, parkour was created four years ago, so it's the fourth edition this year, um, in order by the directors of the of Art Basel, in order to um, engage with the city, creating links, strong links, and uh, ongoing links with the the, the inhabitants and. Um, possibly the visitors of Basel, um, together with the art lovers, um, visitors of the fair. Uh, Jens Hoffman was the curator of parkour in the past three years, and I just uh, uh, inaugurated my first parkour yesterday, as I said. Mm. Um, we um, are going to freely uh, discuss the, the issues of this um, uh, sector of the fair together, and please feel free to engage with us, ask us questions, and uh, any, any of you who want to just uh, let us know and we, we will look at you. For me it's difficult, but I... <laughs> <laughs> um, if we go back to parkour, parkour is, uh, as I said, uh, developed within the city. It's um, this year, every year, there is a new area of the city which is uh, being uh, used for the development of this uh, um, part of the show. This year, it's, uh, the area is called Klingenthal. It's uh, very near here, a five minutes walk, and rather condensed around uh, the former military caserne of the, the um, where the caserne Basel, um, the School of Fashion and Design, and uh, the artist studios are on this plaza, all around this plaza. So we thought we could um, start maybe talking about how we develop the project together and talk maybe about site specificity. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to start. Um, uh, we talked a bit about what we would talk about today. Um, and I think that the, the thing that was seemed the most interesting or the most urgent is the relationship of, of par parkour, this segment of the, of the fair, to the idea of perhaps site specific exhibitions, history of site specificity, and, and maybe how, what our experience of that idea was. I mean, it's still very much part of an art fair, and yet it has uh, certain parameters that are a bit more like an exhibition, and there's a push and pull between those things, push and pull between um, the very temporary nature of uh, the exhibition um, and the uh, commitment to particular sites mm. um, that, that is quite a, an effort in a certain way. Um, and I thought maybe one thing that would be interesting to talk about is perhaps from your perspective, Florence, how you came about thinking about the sites in relationship to the artists, mm -hmm. uh, maybe specifically ours or, or in general. Mm -hmm. um, and then perhaps we could respond in terms of what we came up with mm -hmm. out of those parameters. Yeah, the, the very important uh, aspect of parkour this year in Klingenthal is that Klingenthal is a, a very lively area where uh, the cultural mix is very strong, very important, and where um, many individuals and structures, um, institutions, businesses are located, which are engaged already with culture. So the idea was really uh, to meet as many of these actors of culture within the area as possible and try to understand the history of the area, both on a um, in terms of past, but especially in terms of present, who is actually uh, acting and uh, developing this area on an everyday basis. So I visited, well, the, the, the first aspect is that I was rather near, uh, I live in France, so I could come to Basel at a very early stage and uh, meet people as much as uh, vis visit uh, different possible venues to um, host the art projects. Um, this is how I came to think that um, probably um, the idea of a thematic parkour was not s uh, so much a possibility uh, and instead I rather put all the efforts into uh, 
developing projects with you, with, uh, with the artists of parkour in relation to the venues. So that's where the idea of site specificity mm. came. And, uh, and each of you responded in very different ways. And that's what I think is interesting probably to discuss yeah. together. Yeah. Mm. Do you want to speak about your response to? Uh, I, my location was, uh, is a bike shop, it's a storefront that's functioning that used to be an old uh, print press building. Uh, so I developed uh, a body of work for the project that uh, some of which I think is specific to any site and some of which I uh, used techniques and processes that I thought was interesting towards uh, the history of the old uh, printing press and also worked on site um, while I was installing until I finished allowing the site to inform. Um, for instance, I didn't, uh, elements of chance, we were talking about this earlier, were involved uh, where I didn't know that the building was going to be worked on with scaffolding. Uh, they were doing uh, additions to the windows and making them more secure. And so the scaffolding was coming down slowly as I was installing the exhibition. And towards the last day, I was able to reclaim some of that scaffolding from the actual building and stretch it on these nets for paper making, which I uh, made on site from the peels. And so there are a few different um, elements within the exhibition, and that's one of them that was by chance mm -hmm. using the location. Um, for my project, um, you know, I've, I've Florence and I have worked together for many years on several different projects. So we've sort of developed a, you know, a professional but also a personal rapport and an exchange and, a, and an ongoing conversation. So Florence knew some things that might uh, trigger things from me uh, in terms of the, the site and relationship to past works, etc. Um, and so I, I made a project, a series of sculptures that related to the existence or the pre prior existence of the horse stables that were in relationship to the cavalry on the Kazuna Park. Um, and I, so, so there was that element um, that was very much grounded or generated by the site, generated by the project. Um, but I also wanted to create something, and this was, uh, um, we were talking quite a bit about the notion of conditions, the conditions that become materials that form a work. And I wanted to create a project somehow that acknowledged both the site in terms of um, its outsideness, meaning this, this is something that was um, outside the parameters of the, of the fair space itself. But I also wanted to create a project that uh, seemed to reflect a bit on the, f on the notion of this invisible architecture of the art fair that still surrounds parkour. So the, this project called Dressage was about um, the, uh, the rarefied forms of horse training that produce the com completed horse and, and these um, very high oat, oat, oat schools of, of, of horse riding. And I saw this as a very sort of poignant and uh, resonant uh, parallel to the kinds of training and uh, parameters that, that go on in, in the art world, and I, but I, that's a little vague, but very specifically in an art fair. So I think the parkour is very interesting because it's both inside and outside of the, the parameters of the fair, and I think everybody was sort of grappling with that in one way or another. Um, and I, I, I imagine you were as well, Florence, you know, this notion that um, we're creating very sort of ambitious museum-like projects mm -hmm. within a very t short time frame uh, for a, uh, a very brief period of time. Um, and that becomes a kind of complicated gymnastics in a, in a certain way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, to... <laughs> <laughs> How to explain? Um, there are 17 projects uh, all together as part of parkour. And um, as I said, the, it, the effort was really to not t to avoid pasting, uh, or it's, it might be a really pejorative word to use, but uh, to avoid absolutely to past artworks onto venues which were available, but mm. to really develop this project, of course, in very, very close relationship with the artists. Twelve artists out of 17 are actually present and um, 
install their works uh, themselves for parkour. It's a lot. So not only developing um, within this uh, very close relationship with them, but also in relationship to the location itself. Valérie was mentioning the fact that uh, her project is uh, located within a, um, a space which used to belong to a, a printing house. This was the starting, maybe the starting uh, idea for uh, developing this project together as part of Parkour. Maybe we will uh, talk more about this. And to develop this in relationship to, um, as I said earlier, the actors of the of the uh, area. When I was invited to curate Parkour this year, um, my first thought was, for the reasons that Tom Bird just uh, um, mentioned, um, last year you might have seen the project that Tom developed together with Jenny Yetzer as part of Unlimited, which was a fantastic project. And I was a bit jealous, I have to admit, that happens <laughs> between curators. And uh, when I was invited, I thought uh, of Tom's work uh, from the beginning of his career, which was very much focusing on also on the notion of in situ, of site specificity. And uh, I had for once, I never, well, I almost never uh, request such a precise thing from artists, but I said, Tom, I would really like you to develop a project with me for Parkour on the main plaza, meaning outdoor, and therefore um, thinking again um, backwards and, and in terms of presently, what do you think what site specificity means today? Um, also knowing that Tom a few years ago made this work called Deep Purple, which is, um, well, I can maybe let you speak about this, but uh, just <coughs> to give a point of reference, which is um, a sculpture that was created outdoor, which is a reproduction, uh, two thirds, um, I would say. Um, scale. The scale is like um, uh, a bit diminished, but it's a reproduction in wood um, of Tilted Arc, the sculpture by Richard Serra that was, as you know, installed on Federal Plaza and then taken away, therefore destroying the sculpture. Uh, we talked earlier together about the fact that every time we mention in situ or site specific terms, this sculpture and this artist comes to the to the in, in, in the conversation again. I don't know where, where I wanted to go, but I wanted to just say, I, I requested something quite specific from Tom, um, forcing him somehow to create an outdoor sculpture. So it's very interesting because earlier, maybe we can... Um, I, th I think that's important because we, we, uh, to me, it's very interesting that um, as artists, uh, we more and more have to respond to conditions uh, with increasing rapidity <laughs> that are complex um, and that are, are, are multi-framed. And Florence was referring to earlier works that I've done outside. I mean, I, I have grappled um, with the notion of large-scale site-specific sculpture for some, from some time, always my generation very much questioning uh, previous generations' adherence to, 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 to a certain kind of dogma. Um, and so in my work, I'm trying to, to dismantle that on some level or question that or, or, or nudge it a little bit. Um, and Florence thought perhaps this would be an interesting time because of the parameters of parkour, because of what parkour is about, which mm -hmm. is about finding a site outside the site of the fair itself, um, that I might revisit some of those ideas in a certain way. Um, and that was actually very generative for me. I mean, th that was actually very productive for me to have those parameters sort of put in front of me. And, mm -hmm. and even in terms of the choice of the site, being kind of, you know, nudged into a particular uh, uh, site became the material of, of my ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that's mm -hmm. an interesting thing about uh, where site specificity may have gone or, the, or site related work may have gone is that now I think um, for a lot of artists, site becomes yet another material. Mm -hmm. It becomes, a, it becomes a, 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 a production site as well as simply a location where the artwork exists. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because you, I mean, without get, uh, getting into details, but <laughs> we can say, and generically, uh, that you belong to two different generations. Right. And, and it's interesting the way you, Valérie, uh, are interested also in these notions and how you develop. And talking about production site, that's something very much present in your project. Maybe um, you can develop on uh, the way you... Well, I was also... 
uh, very specific when I when we started working together because there was again this uh, former printing house your work being very much uh, uh, focusing on images and the, pr the, the production of image and the circulation of images I thought of you and then we started from this um, to develop the conversation and to develop the project but um, si the process the notion of process that Tom was mentioning is really very much at the core of what your work in general and this project specifically right it's true but I, I, and I think it's like a material like Tom put it where it where it's something that you can use to add on to uh, ideas and materials that you're already working with mm -hmm. and then it can shift and as it changes from location to ch location and this building has changed it, it didn't stay a printing house forever it now is a bike shop so things don't you know stay the same they can move and they can how did you put it they like snowball meaning right, you know right. they just accumulate accumulate as um, those parameters or yeah. the, the site might change mm. and uh, yeah well that's that was an interesting notion that we developed when we talked uh, together about the, the this capacity that you have uh, to respond to these uh, conditions and these relations which is very uh, interesting mm -hmm. you know I, I, I went back quickly to uh, to look at parkour after we had talked earlier because I wanted to sort of just try to look at it with a fresh state. But I think, I think there's something to be to working in sites like this that has to do with the um, uh, kind of conjuring up of ghosts. Uh, we had talked about nostalgia at one point during this process of, of installing and um, it's not nostalgia. It's, uh, it's about conjuring up certain kinds of architectural, historical, physical ghosts. Uh, and incorporating them into into works. Uh, sometimes those ghosts, and I'm and I'm using that in a, 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 in, a in a sort of provocative way, maybe, but um, those ghosts can be uh, of one's own work, uh, revisiting images that you've used before, revisiting forms you've used before, revisiting uh, the conditions of a site. It's many many layers. Mm -hmm. uh, most. Uh, most of the sites there have had many different lives, mm -hmm. and so as, as an artist project, sometimes it's interesting to try to conjure those up and try to make sense of them, uh, try, try to, to sort of tease them out of the out of the architecture, out of the out of the site. And I think that's sort of what we were both trying to do. And I think what was sort of parkour might be doing generally this parkour, your your parkour. Um, I don't know about the previous instances, but taking a relatively defined geographical area. Um, which I thought was quite fascinating about this, as opposed to many um, international exhibitions that are uh, spread out throughout a city and quite disparate locations. I, I, I found it quite interesting that there was almost a glass invisible wall around a particular area, and that became a lens through which to look at this area. And some pieces had nothing really to do with the area in terms of mm. teasing anything out of it, but simply the juxtaposition of that work and that site creates a, creates a meaning mm. by itself. Um, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. um, Valérie, maybe, maybe I, I'm, I'm kind of obsessive with this, but I would like you to talk maybe the, about this, um, the, the, this process in your work, peeling, for instance, mm. peeling images, that you somehow used also when you discovered the space and started working on the space? Like a peeling of the space, you're saying? Or Somehow. the actual peeling of the images? Um, uh, let's see, some of the... Taking the residues. Yeah, the mm. residues of the space, yes. Um, like the pedestal that was there. I took the photos that they had provided as far as what the space looked like and how I could gauge scale. Um, as a way to, s to start uh, the project description of what I'd be working on. So I asked that, the, um, that I could use that pedestal there. However, I didn't know, and it was a good surprise that uh, it exposed the heating element in the room. The radiator was then exposed when the uh, pedestal was moved from the wall to the window. Um, and also tr not forgetting that it's a storefront, that it's functioning for this bike shop that sits back uh, from the street as a way to draw in customers. Um, and, you know, 
so like leaving the mannequin, leaving elements of the store within it, and not just turning it into a straight uh, art space and pretending like it's not uh, what it is right mm -hmm. now. Um, and that the building being the old print uh, place isn't necessarily a ghost. It's like written on the building bigger than um, the storefront uh, that's now there now, the bike's logo, you know? So it's, it's impossible to ignore Yeah, right? you can't ignore it, I don't think. Um, so I think it's maybe about, yeah, it's not, it's not always important to do in work, but sometimes it can be really generative. It, your choosing of sites, I think both for Tom and myself, <laughs> um, gave us some uh, criteria that pushed our work in, in ways that surprised me. And, uh, I like the idea that I surprised you. <laughs> you like the idea of what? Of surprising yeah. <laughs> you. Yeah. I think those parameters are important. I think that the art that is always interested in me are the, are the, are the artists that are trying to get out of boxes uh, rather than some notion of uh, a, a vision that has no uh, parameters, borders, or I mean, it's kind of, it, mine is a sort of claustrophobic vision, but it, it, to me it mirrors a kind of societal confines. And, and to me, uh, those parameters are what can often, whether they be budgetary, temporal, uh, geographical, etc. Those are the things that that kind of almost uh, create a pressure cooker of, of creative possibilities, um, and the, it's a kind of problem solving. And to have a certain kinds of honestly, if, to, to, if I were to have to choose too much, I, I, my mind would be blank. If I had to, if I had to decide the perfect location for something, my mind would be blank. I, 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 I need to react react against certain conditions, and to have the structure of parkour. Is quite, was quite interesting for me because it, is, it was both formed and unformed, um, both decided and undecided. Um, and so one could whittle, you know, scratch away at where you are um, and, 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 and produce something out of those, those rules, um, those parameters. And I think the other thing that was, is, is quite complex about it is, or interesting about it, is, is that there's a kind of mapping of the different projects together so that you're continually, I mean, maybe I'm was more neurotic about this because I, my project is in an open space, but I was continually trying to understand what the other projects might be mm -hmm. in relationship to mine because I'm aware that they produce meaning in, re in relationship to mine. Um, so that was, that, that, that was kind of a, one of the things that informed a lot of the decisions I made. I think we have a question. Yeah, sorry. Excuse me, we have a microphone, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Marjorie Jacobson from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I was wondering with the majority of the other artists, did you um, allow them to select their own sites or did you monitor what they were doing and guide them? based on what kind of work they were doing? Well, it, it, it's true that these two artists um, tend to show me as a very directive <laughs> curator, which I'm not. So my role is really to select <laughs> from proposals, <laughs> from proposals that are made by artists and galleries. Uh, it just happened that I thought, because these two artists uh, are in their work interested in site specificity, that was interesting to have them both talk. Um, no, that mostly was perfect. Them, but <laughs> yeah. for no, Don Vogue, for instance. Yeah, no, I worked very differently dep depending on each project. So it's true that most of the projects were proposals, and my role consisted in trying to find the best possible location to exhibit this work. Some of the artists actually also came to Basel to check the spaces that were available. Um, they were, it, uh, with each artist, it's a very different uh, story somehow. For Jan Vo, Jan Vo was actually here in Basel. He was on residency in Basel. So that's also the reason why I thought he already developed such a strong relationship with the city. He was a perfect artist to invite. And we found together, by complete chance, the location where his project is right now. Then we explored it. And, um, well, th that's... I, I, it, we were talking about this earlier. It's a bit of a, the, the behind-the-scenes uh, stories, but... Jan 
had a project which was very defined. Uh, it wanted to have this uh, bronze, uh, life-size uh, bronze sculpture of his nephew, Gustav. He took a picture of Gustav trying to show him his uh, wing, which is the photograph you will find in the program here. So the sculpture was supposed to uh, stand very nicely in a space that looks as, well, as much as a frame, as, as a scene, as a nest. It's uh, this beautiful uh, location that uh, I think you already visited. And then the day we installed, I, came, I passed by, and then um, I saw all these elements, these pieces of Gustave lying on the floor. I saw the chains, and somehow I understood that the project was slightly changed. And it's uh, because of this uh, proximity, but not only, it's also the way that Jan works. He's always really um, wanting to challenge all of us as well. It's like until the it, things not, cannot be the way they were planned. It's, uh, it's about life, it's about the magic of art too. And he transformed this space into a slaughterhouse with this poor Gustave um, being shown in pieces. Fragmented. And it's one of the most unbelievable piece I think that he's made. It's really fantastic to see it in this space. So it's also the location that really uh, inspired uh, the project of Jan, yeah, of course. Mm. But I think that's probably true for a lot of, not, not all of the artists, but a lot of the artists that, that there is a certain, only so far you can take when something is going to be sited like this, located in an, in an, an atypical situation. You can only take the project a certain percentage um, and then there's this sort of sometimes terrifying, sometimes exciting last percentage of the project that gets completed because of your process on site. So there are a lot of unknowns um, that can be, uh, that, that, that I think artists oftentimes... Uh, and problem solving. And problem solving. But there's a lot of, um, I think you had also said it in terms of your, when your proposal, one tries to kind of keep at bay conclusions and the end and just try to create mm -hmm. a space for yourself where on site you might develop mm -hmm. s solutions to the final. The merging of the work to the site is something that it perhaps can only happen at the very end. Mm -hmm. And that creates an incredible stress, <laughs> but it creates a, a really kind of beautiful uh, moment. Well, maybe we didn't really want to at the beginning, but we, talked, we spent quite a, a large amount of time talking about the notion of chance. Yes. And when it comes to your project, Valérie, and we see this, uh, f these frames that you bought and by complete chance happened to fit perfectly on the shelves, that was really surprising too. Uh, so the, the, you mentioned yeah. this also for, for your process of uh, producing the, your work, Tom. Yeah. The, the, the and chance you, played a role. I, I think, and I think you end up having to, oh, uh, it's a kind of a funny twist, but the artist often end, end has to calm the people around <laughs> them into trusting them in terms of what the final result will be. Because in particular in a situation, I think it's, a, I think it's intensified in an art fair environment, but one wants to know exactly what the piece is going to look like. The artist has possibly three, four, or five scenarios of what it might exactly end up looking like. And it, I often think that many pieces that I make, and I know this with a lot of colleagues, could have also looked like that. They could al also look sort of similar. There are always variations that could get interpreted in that moment of installation, which in a situation like this becomes a bit like a mobile studio. Mm -hmm. um, you take that studio mentality with you, where it's a, an mm -hmm. experimental moment. And the plan often veers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, off course, mm -hmm. to, to good effect. I think it's really interesting what you said about the, the fact that the, the location will uh, create even uh, some sort of uh, layers of meaning surrounding mm -hmm. the work itself. When, if we think of the project of... Uh, Arthur Zimuski, for instance, mm -hmm. it's quite, um, it's a very sensitive work. Uh, this, it, it's a video called My Neighbors uh, that he shot when he was um, in a residency in Israel, uh, precisely at the moment when the war started in Lebanon. And he went to Tel Aviv and another city in Lebanon to interview people about, and he asked three questions to uh, the people he met. Uh, one of the, the first question was how many people died. The second was about the, the weapons w that were used. And I, I'm forgetting the third one now. And uh, because he knew then people, when, when we are, uh, ask a question, we, we are very um, um, probably uh, attentive. Uh, uh, we, we control what we say, of course. We are worried about 
um, what we might not want to say, but would say. So it asks these people to draw their ideas, their opinions. And by drawing, it's true that people really speak for themselves in such a horrifying way sometimes um, about the situation they're experiencing. Well, to make it short, what I was thinking when I saw the video itself, when I was reviewing the proposals and uh, making the selection, my first um, instinct, if we come back to the idea of we're very much working within the context of an art fair, that's what you were saying, Tom, and it's very much true. I was thinking, do you really want to get into this Palestine, Israel? Probably not. Uh, until I realized, I mean, until I was really uh, so um, taken by this work and uh, so convinced that this work had to, had, had to be shown, that when the possibility to, sh to use a classroom within the school of fashion and design, therefore in a temple of uh, learning, uh, of um, uh, 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 really a platform for learning, for trying to understand a situation, an enclosed place, very secured, very protected, and um, thinking that this was isolating really what, uh, um, what this piece in such a really perfect way somehow. When you see the piece today, when the artist decided not to hang the drawings that come with the video, but to uh, install them very simply on the, on the table in the classroom, uh, suddenly it creates um, a very specific context to experience this work. And I think we can say the same with uh, Lisa Oppenheim's work. Mm -hmm. You will agree probably with me when you enter this, uh, this uh, attic, wooden attic, in which we can hear the sound like if you were outside, uh, we can experience the atmosphere almost. And this work, as we discussed earlier, it's not um, a work that specifically relates to Basel in any way, but mm -hmm. uh, in this context, within this context, it creates such a possibility of an experience that is unique mm -hmm. that I am... Um, yeah. yeah. Um, hmm. Questions, do you think? Yeah, maybe right? some questions. I see a hand up over there. There's somebody in the back. <laughs> I was wondering, did you do anything like this in Reem? Um, have you done anything where you're from or where you're situated, number one? Because I'd love to go if you do do one. <laughs> if you understood my question is where you're, Champagne, Champagne, where you're from. Have you done a parkour in that area? Please do, with Champagne. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I true. To, I wanted to congratulate you. I was just curious where else you're going to do this next because I thought, and one hour I tried to find as many as I quickly could last night at 11 o'clock and I was exhausted having just come from New York City. So that's what I did between 11 and 12 last night, just trying to hit as many as I could. And unfortunately the shop was closed, so I missed yours, but I will go back. But uh, I could miss the hammer because it was right in your face as you arrived. <laughs> but um, and this I I've just wanted to say that the, the uh, Vaux piece, no, I'd seen at Marion Goodman his pieces before, and it never resonated for me, but because of the space and how it was situated and curated and done, it resonated, and it was really most impressive. So I think that is very much to what you're all saying, is an artist taking something and really creating an environment. It was really stunning and important and meaningful and impactful, because then I spoke to the gentleman there and he told me about the story about this young man who felt that was his a wing, not something that was um, you know, uh, something that uh, was a deformity of some sort, which was really enlightening and wonderful because I wasn't sure what, how I should take away and I got to take away something special and uplifting versus something sad and depressing. So anyway, that was very impactful. And um, the one with the Israeli piece in the school I also thought was you know, very impactful the way it was laid out. And so you did a very good job. That's what Thank I want to say. Thank you so much. Some of the, uh, some that resonated more than others, but I went to Vitra today just because of that one piece. So this yeah. morning it made me go there. So, you know, I actually have goosebumps right now just talking about it because what you've done is you've driven me to think differently and experience differently. So I just wanted to say hats off to you. Well, so thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. It's true. It's so Jill's, uh, Jill Maggid's project that you refer to is uh, a project that is directly linked uh, to Basel, the city of Basel. So I might just say, if I have two minutes, what this project is about. It's a, it's a very tricky project. Um, 
Jill um, came to Basel and made a lot of research. Um, she, a few months earlier, she was in Mexico and she became completely fascinated by the work of uh, this Mexican architect, uh, Luis Barragan. She discovered that the archive, the entire archive of uh, Luis Barragan has been purchased by Vitra, uh, who created this uh, Luis Barragan Foundation here in Basel. She also discovered uh, during our research that uh, the very same um, uh, structure acquired uh, the photographic archive, the whole photographic archive of Baragan, which means that everything related to Baragan, almost except for the documents and the archives, the part of the personal archive, sorry, which is still in Mexico, but everything else is located here in Basel, in Switzerland, a country in which Baragan never built anything. So her project um, turns around the idea that she would like to bring a piece of architecture or elements of architecture by Barragan, so to, to reproduce a piece of architecture by Barragan directly onto Vitra's campus. So obviously uh, all this project, when I say it's tricky, it's really uh, raising questions about uh, copyrights and the possibility to access <coughs> Um, someone's archive um, plays with desires and, uh, and, and frustrations as well and she wanted very much to um, collaborate with uh, the Louis Barragan Foundation and it was not possible for copyright reasons but she decided to take the risk and to create this maquette of the Vitra campus to propose, to, to show the proposal that she has and she's basically using platform uh, Parkour, sorry, uh, as a platform to announce a project that she would like to realize. Therefore, we understand realize um, within the s probably the safe um, environment of an institution. Therefore, in relationship with a, a whole milieu, professional milieu. So that's um, something that uh, is pretty much like turning upside down. It's true. Uh, the purpose also of of parkour, which I think is really fascinating. So it's, a, it's really like um, uh, all these exchanges, it's not only um, my work, it's just really uh, the work of the whole team who could find the venues, but it's also all these relationships. And we come back to what Tom, you said at the very beginning, what, the importance of uh, the, all the discussions we had um, mm -hmm. and continue to have about this book, which was really a, um, a nice experiment that we built really one day after the other within three months. Practically. I was just going to also say in, re in response to that comment, I mean, I think that it's, it's twofold maybe that on the one hand, artists, um, the work can be seen in a different light because it's in these spaces that are outside the white spaces that we're typically viewing them in. At the same time, I wonder if it's not just a relief on the eye from, for, for viewers in a strange way. Um, not just that the work has been generated in a different way, that's part of it. The other part of the equation is that one can actually see things in a different way when, when, they, when they're taken out of, there's a monotony of, of visual experience, regardless of the level of the work or your interest in the work. But then put in a different context, there's, a, there's something that jars it, that, that, that you see anew um, when, when things are put in, in different contexts. And it doesn't have to be a work that relates to that context, it's just seeing it in that context. Um, lets, a little, lets a different air into the room, into the situation maybe. So mm. it's maybe a viewer experience as well as a, a production experience or an artist's experience um, mm. that, that I think is, is, is needed maybe mm. um, in general. Well, if there's no more questions, I have a question for the two of you <laughs> to, to finish maybe. Um, this, um, did this ex uh, experience, this project that we developed together, give you um, ideas or, or desires to work again in such a, a way, context, uh, within a city, in different spaces, I don't know, mm -hmm. in the future, I in mean? In the future? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Uh, it might even be as daring as to do an outdoor piece <laughs> <laughs> at some point. You know, it's um, sure. 
yeah. Um, the outdoor thing, it's, it's, it, it's a funny thing. We, we, we talked about those last minute sort of changes and we also, I'm also interested, preoccupied maybe with preservation, aging, and decay <laughs> of, of objects. I think it's one of our fascinations uh, with, with art mm -hmm. is, the, is this notion. And, we, and, and, I, and I was thinking about this, that you know, even when you create something that's about fragmentation, it's about decay, that's about uh, a certain kind of patina, there's this incredible desire from, from, and I think it has many different sources, to stop that process the second it's declared an artwork. Um, you know, there one can, uh, you know, Karen Kalimnik can scatter uh, endless little pieces of glitter and, and, and have this effect of, 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 um, of disarray. But then there's also always also that desire to see it exactly the same way every single time from that moment on. Um, and that's I, like, a, like a pop song too, or any recorded bit of music. It like has you to think be repeated. That that's the song, and when they play it in concert, like you want that performed just like that. Right. You know? like it gets frozen. One, one recording. Yeah. But I wonder about that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, you know, de decay is not embraced. <laughs> um, and maybe that's also one of the fascinating things about if, if we don't allow that in the work, to be inherent in work, even though it's a preoccupation of many artists, perhaps that was something that's, it, that was a bit interesting about the parkour sites, that at least the, 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 then the works are in these sites that are in various states of decay and misuse or disuse or previous use. Um, and, and I think that's one of the seductive things about that and, area. And the risk that it either loses meaning when it's moved from the site or that it gains meaning again. Right. But there's a risk in that, you know, right. if you're making site-specific right. work. Right. So how do you see the works that you've created within the context of Baku, how do you see their future lives? How do you imagine their future exhibitions? Valérie, maybe we can start. Um, well, I, I think that there can be, for some of them, there's a variety of ways that um, they can be displayed. Uh, and I guess I, I will consider those options and parameters, like the, the pedestal, for instance, I didn't build, it doesn't, it's part of the shop and it stays with it, but um, a, that pedestal could be, perhaps be uh, rebuilt to that scale or this other scale that I've used before that's specific to other works within my practice. And the melted laminates on the wall, I, that's going to carry some of the wall texture with it um, when it's transferred again. I don't know how many times those can be reapplied, uh, but and so I don't know if I have a good solution for how they can be done next, but I know that they can be applied at least maybe one more time, but it'll take some of that uh, with it. So will it bring with it um, something of the context, the first context in, in which it was shown, you think? How do you see this aspect? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think that um, I, I, I try to make work, I, I, I have trouble making work that's not inspired by a site. And that can be a gallery. That can be my studio. That can be. That doesn't have to be such a um, articulated site uh, as 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 the ones we're talking about. But I do sort of believe in um, the origins of the work, and that the origins of the work um, are are carried forward. And so that once these sculptures or this project moves to another location, there will there is necessarily. Uh, and I couldn't even stop it if I wanted to, going to be conversation, anecdotal stories, um, written pieces about where it was originally installed. That I've come to kind of like and believe in that trail that gets sourced out and gets talked about. Uh, someone will say to somebody else, this was derived from this where it was originally installed in Art Parkour in, in 2013. So I'm very self-conscious about the, the, that aura <laughs> you know, that, that moment of origin and what it was responding to will be, will be carried forward. And also very careful not to um, make something that is entirely dependent upon that initial site either because I don't, I, I, I'm not interested in that kind of, mm. that notion of site specificity. That's very interesting. Mm. I, 
think they want to ask. If one last question. We have one. I think um, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but I saw lots of threads about society at large and using specific subcultures to talk about societies. Is this something that you were thinking about? Because the whole art parkour in itself is almost like a small society. Hmm. Well, yeah, there are two, yeah, there are things that I didn't mention, but uh, when I wanted to talk about um, the in interaction with the people which are actually, who are actually the actors of this area, there are two things that, well, three, but two projects that were developed in collaboration. One was, um, is Olaf Brunig's project. It's very important because the school were already in contact. They, they went to New York to meet him. They invited him to do a workshop and I got to know that. So I contacted Olaf. And so they chose the artist in a way. And um, I asked Olaf, would you be happy to develop this project? The school is happy because I talked with the school first. Um, would you be happy to develop this project within the context of parkour, which obviously will give much more visibility to this project? And he said yes, he developed the project together with the students from the school. They did this uh, photo shoot, um, you saw the, the images in the windows and the long chairs. They had a lot of fun. That's one project. And the other one is the Caserne Basel, the theater and the place for dance, with whom I talked about dance, which I don't know nothing about, and I talked about art. And we tried to find points of connections until I realized that the LA Dance Project with ben that was created by Benjamin Milpied uh, created two, well, Benjamin created two pieces, one together with uh, Christopher Wool, who did the decor, uh, and then he was working on a new piece together with Barbara Kruger. So when I thought, Wow, two of the most important living artists in the world dis decided to work with this dancer and choreographer. I'm interested to know why. I want to see that. For reasons like logistic reasons, the, the piece by Barbara Kruger couldn't fit uh, Kazan. So I started the discussion again with them and I learned that they are the sole owners of this very early piece by Mercer Cunningham that Cunningham developed um, together with, um, for the costume, the decor, uh, the accessories and the light were created by Robert Rauschenberg and the music was created by Lamonte Young. So I thought, well, then it was changed at the last minute, but my idea was to really show the contemporary piece and to show uh, the historical piece. So that's what we were intending to do. And then for technical reasons, the two pieces were inversed. But uh, that was also a collaboration. I didn't want to bring only art into a place which is a place for theater and dance, essentially. They do a lot of, uh, they present a lot of dance. I thought it would be much more interesting to come from our perspective and their perspective and try to do something. Um, and the last project is, uh, the last collaboration is with the, you know, the artist studios where Artie Zemis piece is, uh, uh, sorry, well, um, Lisa Oppenheim's piece is being shown. This building is full of studios for artists that were created in 1964. Most of the artists today, they are, they are still the same people who received the, the studio back then. And they asked me at the beginning, I mean, we're happy to host you in this uh, fantastic attic, but it, would it be a problem for you if, if some of us, if we want, we open our studio that day? And of course, it was, no, of course, that's very interesting. So they have this uh, red flag to say, my studio is open, please come uh, during the week of Art Basel. So. Voila. Thank you. <laughs> voilà. Thank you. <coughs> I think we have to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.